All right, what the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And in today's video, I want to talk about five running backs who looks like they're going to be overdrafted in the NFL draft later this month. And so I want to make sure that you are not then overdrafting them in your rookie drafts as a result. The following players are going to be overdrafted in the NFL draft, and you should not follow suit in your rookie drafts. Let's get into it. <laughs> As of now, Grinding the Mocks has 14 running backs who are currently being mocked as like we should expect them to be drafted, which would be very low. Um, in the last five years, an average of 21.6 running backs have been drafted per year, and the lowest amount of running backs drafted in a draft in the last five years was 19, which happened in both 2020 and 2021. So we've seen like a little bit of a downward trend, but it would be a large drop off to 14. And the strength of this draft class is its depth. Like we don't have, this isn't one of those classes where you have like Saquon Barkley, Nick Chubb, Darius Geis. We don't have a bunch of these like elite dudes at the top. We've got, you know, Brees Hall is probably number one. And then we got some like decent players. And then we've got like a bunch of guys who are like role players, solid NFL dudes, maybe not fantasy contributors, but like guys who should be drafted and like make NFL teams. And if only four of them are selected, I would be shocked. Having said that, there are only 14 right now. And the rules for this video is I'm not going to be talking about anybody who's being mocked like fifth round or later. Even if I don't think you're like you're any good, like whatever. If you're taken in the sixth round, you're probably not overdrafted. And I think this is this is helpful because draft capital obviously matters. Like we want the convergence of like talent and draft capital, talent and opportunity for fantasy assets. And like third round Isaiah Spiller is a more attractive fantasy asset than sixth round Isaiah Spiller, given the opportunity baked in with that draft capital. But he's still the same player either way. He didn't become a better player overnight in the event that he gets taken in the third round versus the sixth round. So I want to keep in mind the talent level of these players in the context of their draft capital. Because like, if you're treating third round Darrington Evans as if he should carry the same performance expectations as like third round David Montgomery or third round David Johnson, number one, you're being dumb. Number two, you're just like voluntarily forfeiting value that you could have by paying attention to how good players are rather than just like being spoon fed what the NFL thinks. So with that in mind, the number one guy I want to talk about is Jerome Ford, who is kind of on the fourth, fifth round line right now. Um, his expected draft position right now is 138.5, which I haven't looked into like where compensatory picks fall out and like if that would be like fourth round or fifth round this year it's usually on that line but he's going right around pick 140 in the mocks rb10 in this class right now and he would be drafted that highly because he's an athletic big play runner with solid production he ran a 446 in the 40 um, which is 74th percentile he's flying 20 which is just the last 20 yards of the 40 yard dash like hypothetically that's your top speed it was actually a 79th percentile number so it's even faster than his 40 was and he was a productive dude um this last year at cincinnati his only year as the starter he had a 31 percent dominator rating which is in the 73rd percentile for fourth year guys um, on a cincinnati team that went 13 and 1 finished fourth in the country he had 1500 yards 20 touchdowns on a good team and he's a dynamic runner. He forced 0.29 missed tackles per attempt in his college career, which is in the 88th percentile. And as an open field guy, he converted 37% of his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, which is in the 76th percentile. So he's got some juice. So why would he be overdrafted in the late fourth round? Number one, he's a tweener. And what that means is, like, we want our running backs to fit into established, like, defined roles. And, you know, obviously we'd like everyone to be David Johnson or Le'Veon Bell or Todd Gurley, where they're, like, big, athletic, catch passes, can run the ball well, we're productive. Like, obviously we want all of that. But not everybody has that. And so... If you're undersized, like, we want you to be, like, fast and catch passes so you can be a satellite back. If you're a big dude and you don't catch passes, like, we want you to, like, run the ball effectively. And Jerome Ford is neither big or a good pass catcher. He had a 20th percentile target share in college. He was fairly efficient on the targets he did get, 77th percentile yards per target. I think he's got decent hands, but he wasn't used very dynamically. The degree of difficulty on his receptions, on his targets, was not very high. And so I don't know that he's a complete liability in the passing game. I think he's fine. But as a slightly undersized running back at, you know, 5'10 and a half, 210 pounds, you'd like that guy to be able to contribute in the passing game to like a positive degree, not just to a not negative degree. And the other guys at that size are like, you know, the other successful guys at that size are like Dalvin Cook, Miles Sanders, Tony Pollard, Kenyon Drake. These are like undersized running backs, fairly thin frames, but they, those guys all catch passes. Something that Jerome Ford just isn't great at. Like I said, he's fine. I don't think it's a strength of his game. And to add to that, he's also like kind of a boom bust runner. He had positive overall efficiency in college, a 118% box adjusted efficiency rating, 
which is in the 58th percentile, kind of indicating that like given the box counts that he's seeing, he's producing more per touch than the other guys on his team are. He's good there. But his relative success rate, which looks at like how often is he producing positive outcomes on his carries, not using an average, but like it's a rate stat, a consistency stat. How often is he navigating the line of scrimmage well, um, gaining a requisite amount of yards given down distance? He was just bad there. For his career, negative 5% relative success rate, 13th percentile. And even just looking at when he was at Cincinnati, you know, he started his career at Alabama, playing with some really talented guys. Just in this last year at Cincinnati, as the lead back, negative 1.8% relative success rate, 27th percentile. And like I said before, he's creating big plays at a high rate. He's good in the open field. He's breaking tackles. But on a play-to-play basis, He's not succeeding consistently relative to his teammates. You don't really want to see that. So I think given his frame, given his lack of pass catching like ability, given that he's a boom bust runner, he's kind of a Chuba Hubbard type, sort of a Jeremy Langford type guy. If he goes in the fifth round, goes in the fourth round, like whatever, I'm probably not touching him close to that value in rookie drafts. The next guy I want to talk about is, who is it? Brian Robinson. Next guy I want to talk about is Brian Robinson, who's currently being mocked at the 123 spot in the mock drafts, uh, which would be in the fourth round as the RB8 in this class. And he's going to be drafted that high or higher. I wouldn't be surprised to see him creep up into the third round because he's big, fast, he's got a three down skill set, and he went to Alabama. And all of those things sound great. He is almost 6'2", 224, 453 speed. It's an 85th percentile speed score. Uh, three down skill set. He's got, he had 35 receptions last year at Alabama. Um, and I think he's a solid runner. He's a good like instinctive runner. I think kind of the opposite of Jerome Ford. He's not a big play guy, but in like navigating the line of scrimmage, you know, displaying vision and, you know, picking the right holes and things like that. He had a 5.4% relative success rate, which is in the 78th percentile. And at Alabama, you know, obviously, maybe the best program, maybe the best program in the country, 1,600 yards, 16 touchdowns this last year, solid production. So why would he be over overdrafted in the third or fourth round? He's simply not that good. Like, bird's eye view, he looks nice. Big, fast, catches passes, was productive, checks all the boxes. His athleticism, I think, though, is pretty fraudulent. Um, he ran a 4.53, but the only metric, athleticism-related metric, where he's above average, other than his 40-yard dash, is his 10-yard split on his 40-yard dash, which is just the first 10 yards of the 40, very technique heavy, basically you're exploding out of a three-point stance. He was like 80th percentile there, and his flying 20, which is, you know, the last, like, the top speed part of the 40-yard dash, he was like 48th percentile. He was bad in the agility drills. He was bad in the jumps. So I don't think he has good top speed. He's not that fast. He just trained well for the 40-yard dash. So he's a big dude with fraudulent athleticism. It's not that good. And his production is pretty fraudulent as well. He spent five years at Alabama, and this last year, he was productive, but the only reason he was in school is because COVID happened in 2020, and everybody was granted an extra year of eligibility. He had already used up four years. He didn't take a redshirt year, so he played for four seasons, was not productive, and the thing is that Alabama's 2020 season wasn't even really affected by COVID. They played 13 games still. He wasn't at one of these programs that played like a four-game schedule and just got fucked. He played a full schedule in 2020, was gifted an extra year was gifted an extra year of eligibility and able to come back, was good as the lead back at Alabama, although his dominator rating is only in the 48th percentile. It's not like he was super dominant. But raw production numbers, solid. But like how many dudes in the past have like done nothing at solid programs for four years and like hypothetically would have been good in their fifth year if they had received a fifth year and then been able to come back as the starting running back after they're like older and more experienced than literally anybody else. Like the only time when Brian Robinson was a good college football player was during a season that most college football players don't even get the opportunity to have. So why should I be impressed? He also doesn't really have juice as a runner. Again, the opposite of Jerome Ford. Jerome Ford is creating plays in the open field. Brian Robinson's not doing that at all. 13.6% breakaway conversion rate. Second percentile. 94.6% box adjusted efficiency rating. 10th percentile. Very, very low. And so... Yes, he's a good instinctive runner. I think he can navigate the line of scrimmage well. He's not going to, you know, be a net negative for you in the running game. He's fine. He's good there. But, like, his overall efficiency was lagging so far behind the other dudes at Alabama. And, you know, a retort to that is like, okay, but yeah, it was Alabama. The other running backs are really good. But I think if you look back in history, like, the other guys who played at Alabama, what their team relative efficiency stats looked like, where does Brian Robinson fall? The guys since 2007 who had better team relative efficiency stats than Brian Robinson does are Derrick Henry, Najee Harris, Glenn Coffey, Mark Ingram, Eddie Lacy, Damian Harris. Outside of Glenn Coffey, those guys have all been, like, productive 
some of them really, really good NFL running backs. The guys below Brian Robinson on that list are Josh Jacobs, Kenneth Darby, TJ Yeldon, Trent Richardson, Kenyon Drake, and Bo Scarborough. Other than Jacobs, who's kind of just like a jag with volume, none of those guys have been good in the NFL. TJ Yeldon has stuck around for a little bit. Bo Scarborough had a couple decent games. Trent Richardson flamed out. Brian Robinson kind of straddles that line, and he's closer to the numbers of the guys on the bad side of it than he is to the guys on the good side of it. I think he's kind of like a Buck Allen type in the NFL. He's a committee back who can play on all three downs. Don't treat him like he's some box-checking, like, no-doubt guy. He's not. Uh, The next guy I want to talk about is Zamir White out of Georgia, currently being mocked in the late third round as the RB5, and he's going to be drafted highly because he's big, very fast, and he was a good two-down pounder at Georgia. He's almost six feet tall, 217 pounds, and ran a 4-4 flat, which gives him a 95th percentile speed score. And at Georgia, he had back-to-back 800 scrimmage yard seasons, back-to-back seasons with 11 touchdowns, played on teams that finished fourth, seventh, and first in the country. And, you know, kind of like Brian Robinson, he was really good at navigating the line of scrimmage. He displayed good vision. He was a consistent runner relative to his teammates, 5.2% relative success rate, 76th percentile. I think he's a good, like, instinctive runner. So why will he be overdrafted in the third round? Number one, that speed he showed at the Combine has absolutely not translated to the field. He has a 98.6% box-adjusted efficiency rating, which is just in the 14th percentile. So his overall efficiency, despite like consistent play succeeding on his runs relative to his teammates, his overall efficiency is very poor. He's reaching the secondary less often than his teammates are, 1% lower in 10-yard run rate. And once he's in the secondary, his breakaway conversion rate is 25%, which is a 24th percentile number. So... He's not producing efficiently relative to his teammates. He's not reaching the secondary more often than his teammates are. And once he's in the secondary, he's not converting those plays into breakaway runs at a rate that's impressive at all. So, like, where is the speed showing up in his actual on-field performance? It's not. The only box counts against which he was more efficient than the other guys at Georgia were eight-man boxes and nine-man boxes, which is essentially just like short yardage situations. So he's close to 220 pounds. He shows like good vision and things like that in navigating in navigating the line of scrimmage. He's good in short yardage. He's a two-down grinder, man, and he doesn't catch passes. Second percentile in target share, seventh percentile receptions totals, 38th percentile average depth of target, 40th percentile yards per target. The fourth lowest true catch rate in the class. He is not a three-down back at all, has no receiving chops to speak of at this point in his development. The speed that he showed at the Combine is nowhere to be found in his on-field metrics. He's a committee back. He's a two-down back. That's what he is. The next guy I want to talk about is James Cook, also from Georgia, currently being mocked in the third round at the 80.0 spot as the RB4 in this class. And he's going to be drafted highly because he's fast. He's a good receiver. He went to Georgia and he's Dalvin Cook's little brother. 4-4-2 in the 40. 1.83 1.83 flying 20. That's 89th percentile. He has near elite speed, and he's maybe the most dynamic receiver in this class. 67 receptions in college. He was split out wider in the slot almost 28% of the time. That's 94th percentile for running back. So he's moved around the formation all over the place. 9.3 yards per target, 97.1% true catch rate on these advanced targets downfield, not out of the backfield. He's an incredible receiver. So that's completely legitimate. And he went to Georgia, you know, high level of competition. He's Dalvin's brother. He's got the pedigree. He's going to be overdrafted. Maybe not in the NFL draft. This one's more of just like a fantasy take. But in dynasty drafts, you can't draft him based on where he went in the NFL draft because he's small and skinny. He's almost six feet tall, but he's 204 pounds. The dude's built like a stick. He has no two down, you know, no first and second down upside, no rushing upside. He's going to be exclusively a satellite back in the NFL. And out of that, like, what are you getting in fantasy? You're getting like some jet sweeps. You're getting him like split out wide. He's a satellite back, like maybe some PPR value, but like, what are you hoping for? Chris Thompson, Naeem Hines, relative to other guys who go in the third round, you cannot take Chris Thompson at the, you know, 206 in a fantasy draft. Don't do it. The last guy I want to talk about is Isaiah Spiller out of Texas A&M, currently being mocked at the 79.2 spot in the third round and as the RB3 in this class. And he'll be drafted highly because he's got good size, he's got pass catching chops, he's got production in the SEC, and he's got the tape. Ooh baby, the tape is so nice with Isaiah Spiller. He's six foot, 217. He got 74 passes in college. That's 84th percentile. He had a 60th percentile target share, 63rd percentile average depth of target. So he's catching passes downfield. He's catching a lot of them. He's involved in the passing game. And production in the SEC, he broke out as an 18-year-old true freshman on a team that went 8-4. and four. And then he's got three straight seasons with 1,000 scrimmage yards, 20 receptions on solid teams in the SEC. And the tape, man, you got to watch the tape. Type in Isaiah Spiller versus on YouTube and cream yourself over this man's tape. 
He's going to be overdrafted in the third round because he's a historically inefficient runner. His 93.2% box adjusted efficiency rating is a ninth percentile number. His negative 5.8% relative success rate is a 10th percentile number. So these people who are telling you that he's actually good, he's just not fast, are wrong because he's succeeding on his carries far less often than his teammates are. He's producing efficiently far worse than his teammates are. And he's not athletic. 4.64, uh, 23rd percentile burst score. His flying 20 is in the 10th percentile. His best athletic trait, as far as like measured athletic traits, is his 54th percentile mark in, I think that's the short shuttle. It's either that or the three cone. Whatever is the one agility drill he did, he was 54th percentile. Red ribbon for Isaiah Spiller at being not terrible at something. But all of that bad athleticism, like, shows up in the numbers of his on-field performance. Like, I've spent a lot of time roasting Isaiah Spiller. Check out my earlier video on him. It's called, like, Isaiah Spiller's the next Trent Richardson. Check out my article on him called, uh, what the fuck's it called? My comprehensive take on Isaiah Spiller. Find me on Twitter, at No More Parties. Stuff is there. I'm the man who took down Isaiah Spiller. From, like, a physical standpoint, he's Daria Gunbawale, he's Alfred Blue, he's Mike Davis. Those are the most successful guys among his, like, top 10 physical comps, like athleticism, body type. Those are the best ones. Agunbawale, Blue, Davis. Those dudes suck. And he, like, the calling card for Isaiah Spiller is that he's a good receiver. Like, even if you, like, a lot of the film guys now, a lot of these dudes who are all over Isaiah Spiller are like, okay, he might not be an efficient runner, but he's, like, big and he's got, like, three down ability. So they've, like, they've conceded that he might not be a good runner at this point. But they're they're hanging on to this, like, big three down ability thing. And despite good volume, I don't even know that I'm willing to say he's that good of a receiver. 24th percentile yards per reception. 40th percentile yards per target. 54th percentile catch rate which is okay, but his true catch rate, just looking at targets that are catchable, 25 out of 38 in this class, so he's below average in this class. I don't have true catch rate for like historical prospects, but just among 2022 running backs, he's below average in true catch rate. He wasn't efficient on the on his targets. Where are the good things for Isaiah Spiller other than like he looks pretty on film? He's a Wayne Gallman level talent being propped up as some like elite back because the tape grinders saw him like training with the footwork king on a Twitter video. Like he's the next carry on Johnson. I think people have kind of caught on. His stock has dropped even among the like the EDP like mock draft data since his terrible combine. I've been banging this drum since like January. Isaiah Spiller's overrated. He's going to be overdrafted. You cannot take him in the first round of a rookie draft. You probably shouldn't take him in the early second round of a rookie draft, even if he gets third round draft capital. Like, just don't do it. Let somebody else take a bad player. Let somebody else get saddled with the next Monte ball. Don't do it. These guys are going to be overdrafted. Who is it? Zamir White, Brian Robinson, James Cook, Jerome Ford, Isaiah Spiller, these SEC affiliated fraudulent running backs who are actually not good. Don't do it. Resist the temptation. Draft capital, speed score, fuck them. These guys suck. Thanks for checking out the video. Uh, what do you gotta do? You gotta hit like, you gotta hit subscribe, you gotta find me on Twitter, you gotta catch the video on Sunday. I think I'm talking about Brees Hall. Peace.